We get asked a question over and over again in our lives. From the time we're a little kid. We get asked by our teachers, we get asked by parents, we even get asked by our friends. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's a simple question. You may even get sick of hearing it, right? <laughs> Yet, for some reason, this question can either A, be something you have the expectation of giving one answer, or two, you may find it the most difficult question to answer because you just don't know the answer to it. While I'm here today to kind of share about my journey, because I went from a place of knowing the answer to completely redefining what that answer should be. Because I think sometimes we can't boil our answers down to one and even necessarily put it in one box because who we are as individuals is so much more complex and so much more multifaceted than just one answer. So let's start with our journey here. Let's go back to that picture. Okay, that's me at five years old. And when people ask me that question, Larissa, what do you want to be when you grow up? Doctor. Typical answer, my dad was a doctor, so it made sense that I would become a doctor. I got good grades, so again, it made sense logically. Smart kids became doctors. Now, that picture is of me on the piano, and I was forced to play piano by my mother at age five. And it might be a little bit of foreshadowing here, but again, the box that I checked off when people asked me that question, and I answered with pride, because it was almost like, hey, I know the answer to that question. I was that kid that wanted to raise her hand when the teacher asked every single question and had an answer, too. So I thought I was going to be a doctor. Here's 10-year-old me. And then when I got asked that question, what do you want to be with when you grow up? I got a little ambitious. I wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer, interior designer, psychologist, singer, and actress, which seems a little ridiculous wasn't completely realistic. At the same time, I feel like I wasn't completely off base from where I am today. And I'll explain that more in a little bit. Here I am in high school. Those of you who attend Diamond Bar High School, you may recognize uh, the, the, the colors there. I got back into my box when I was in high school and just settled on being a doctor. But somewhere along the way, I realized when I was about 16, my junior year in high school, I don't like the sight of blood. I can't handle the sight of guts. Maybe I shouldn't be a doctor. I remember helping my dad out in his clinic one day and thinking, I can't imagine doing this for the rest of my life. So all of a sudden, I had this box, this nice safe box of being a doctor, and I was left with this, question marks. I went from being so confident I was going to be a doctor to question marks. And I, I was going through this identity crisis. I had like no idea what I was going to do. Because again, I was this overachieving, know-it-all kid. I had my whole life planned out. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I wasn't going to be a doctor. What am I going to do? So I went from question marks, let me get the question marks back up, to this. And then I started to take a step back and I was like, hold up, this, this is a blank screen. You know what? The possibilities now are endless. I started to realize this was a plus. Before I thought I was boxed into being a doctor, and now I could be anything that I want to be. So what do I decide to do? I decide the next logical step from going from doctor is I want to be a music producer and songwriter, which again makes absolutely no sense. But you know, here's the thing. Backing it up a little bit, you saw the picture of me playing the piano. So I had the roots of planted of, of the music education. And I was in band in junior high. And I started singing in public events when I was in high school. And I started writing my first song when I was 13. 
So I had this musical talent that was being cultivated, but I had no idea that I could actually make a career out of it. And for some reason, in my crazy little 16-year-old head, I thought that I could be a professional music producer and songwriter. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because I had to break the news to my parents. And let me tell you, when I told my parents that I didn't want to be a doctor anymore and that I was going to go into music, they absolutely flipped out. Okay, They were trying to talk me out of it. They're like, you're going to starve. The odds are against you. What are you doing? You're throwing your life away. And so they would throw out things like, it's like a million to one. So let me show you the odds my parents gave me. OK, Larissa's odds of working in the music, a million to one. And first of all, they were saying things like, no one like you has done this. I know what they meant by that. They looked at me. I'm Chinese American. I'm a girl working in a predominantly white male industry. What am I thinking? But then I'm like, wait a second. They just like threw out some odds, like some random odds of a million to one. You know, people say that when they think you can't do something. Like, if I've never done, if no one like me has done this before, then there are no odds, right? <laughs> I get to make my own odds. And if I succeed, I'm one for one. And there began my journey to doing something completely unconventional. I went to UCLA, go Bruins. And here's where my compromise came in with my parents a little bit. I got a business economics degree. I didn't get a music degree so that they would at least have some peace of mind. If things didn't work out, I had a business degree. Now, I actually liked business and economics and did very well in my classes. I and I understood that the music business was just that. It was a business. But I was also just kind of not even like fitting in when I was in college, and, and, and I was just this odd duck. Because here I was a business economics major at UCLA, and everyone around me in my classes was looking to be an accountant or finance banking. They were going to interviews to be management consultants. And here I was working at record companies and recording studios. I was kind of out of place. But I kept going. So much so that after I graduated from college, I was offered a job at a record label. And at first, I didn't take this job because it was as the financial controller. And even though I had a business economics degree, I didn't really plan on using it. I was going to be a music producer and a songwriter. But eventually, I relented and I took this job because I thought, hey, it's a start. And it would put my degree to good use. So I ended up being promoted to becoming the chief financial officer of this record label. And I was only 22. So I became a record executive at a very early age. While I was at the record company, I ended up singing with a group called Nitro Praise. Now here again, I'm going and defying expectations, because first of all, I'm a 22-year-old chief financial officer. So imagine the funny looks I got going into business meetings. I would go in with business meetings with the president, and they probably thought I was his secretary or intern, to be honest. Because I was 22, but because I was blessed with those Asian genes, I probably looked like I was 16. And I'm going into these business meetings, and you know everybody's kind of ignoring me until they come up to the topic of money. And all of a sudden, the president's like, oh, you need to talk to Larissa. And then all of a sudden, I became the most important person in the room because I signed everybody's checks. And so they were offered me, at one point, to sing with this group called Nitro Praise. Now, your chief financial officer normally should not be singing. <laughs> and normally, singers don't become chief financial officers. So I thought I was filling in for this lead singer who had to drop out for this, this big tour. And I ended up singing with the group for two years while I was running this record label. And they nicknamed me the singing CFO. I'm going to show you a picture of our group. There we are. Nitro Praise. And as you can see, it's a very multi-ethnic group. And here again, people would say crazy things to me when I tour the country. Now, I went to some really small towns. I went to some small towns where like, there were like barely any Asians. And I got that, wow, your English is so good <laughs> comment. Because they didn't expect somebody like me to be singing with a group like this. And we did dance music. 
We did gospel dance music, and they didn't expect that from me. So fast forward, I ended up leaving the record company and embarking on my own solo career, which I never thought I would do because I didn't set out to be a singer. But see, here's the thing. Remember, I had an empty slate, an empty box, and I could kind of do whatever I want now. And part of doing whatever I want was also not limiting myself to what I could possibly do. So I ended up becoming a solo artist. And here we go, whoops, there we go. And I was blessed enough to be able to put out several solo albums and tour the country and tour the US and, and Asia. Now, a lot of people are like, well, this is great, you're an independent artist and you've had some success. And I went on to also write music for as mentioned in earlier, Oprah Winfrey show, some of, these are some of my other clients. I did music for Sleeping Dogs video game, Dance Dance Revolution, and different networks and TV shows. And this was all really cool because I got to be a professional songwriter and music producer. And then some people would say like, well, but you know, you're not Beyonce. You're not world famous. But you know what? That's not my motivation to why I was doing what I was doing. You know, sometimes we think just because we're in a small town, a small city, a small school, or, or maybe we don't even feel like we're doing that big of a thing because we're not Beyonce, we're not Bill Gates, you know, we're not Steven Spielberg. I'll tell you what I did with my music. I make music to make an impact. I make music to help sex trafficking victims get out of human slavery with my concerts. My song, I Feel Alive, was featured in a nationwide suicide prevention campaign that featured different celebrities. This is why I do what I do. It's not just about defying expectations, but it's also using what you have been given to do something greater than what you are. Because if we're just measured by doing something big and world famous all the time, then do any of us stand a chance if those are the odds we're calculating? But if we're redefining our own odds, if we're redefining what it means to be successful, then it's more about the meaning than it is about the fame. I had the opportunity to also host a talk show. I hosted a talk show for nine years. And we were able to spotlight humanitarians on our show that were doing important things around the globe, like bringing clean water to Africa, to rescuing child, child soldiers in northern Uganda. We were spotlighting important issues like bullying and cutting. And on the talk show that I'm currently hosting, we're doing the same thing. We're giving advice to teens and young adults who might be having issues, whether it comes to relationships, where it comes to deeper issues in their lives. These are things that, again, maybe I'm not world famous, but these are affecting people's lives on an individual basis. These are defying expectations. Recently, I was able to do a project that is very near and dear to my heart. You know, I spoke at the beginning about not knowing where I was going. I had that blank slate. And let me just kind of rattle off up until this point, not just being a doctor, right? And you know how I said I was going to be a psychologist and all those other things, an interior designer and doctor? Well, I got to add another thing to my column. Uh, two years ago, I took a fateful trip to Cleveland, Mississippi. And I uncovered something that was remarkable. Um, I married someone who was also very unconventional. His name is Only One, and he's a hip hop artist. Here, let me show you a picture of him. Oh, there he is. Oops, let me go back. There he is. He is a mechanical engineer who is also a rapper. <laughs> So he and I both kind of defy these traditional expectations. And his family has a very interesting lineage. 
His grandfather and great-grandfather came from China to Mississippi. And when we went there to visit his gra the gravesite of his, grand his grandfather and great-grandfather, what we uncovered was so much more. I had no idea there was a whole population of Chinese immigrants that had lived and worked in the Deep South during a time of segregation as early as the mid to late 1800s. And this was mind blowing to me. So I made a documentary. I started out being the music composer for this documentary called Finding Cleveland, and I ended up directing the project. Now this is a documentary short, and we thought we would enter it into one film festival. We ended up going to 10 film festivals, winning four of them, and now we have done screenings all across the country. You know why? Because this isn't just a small story. This is a small story that has big impact. And people around the corner kept telling us, oh, what are you gonna do? It's just a short, it's 15 minutes long. Actually, it's a little bit less. And all along the way, when you defy expectations, whether it's being an independent artist, whether it's doing a documentary short about Chinese in Mississippi, people are going to have a lot of skepticism towards you. And there's a lot of people that might even say like, why are you doing what you're doing? Go make more money doing something else. We've had a big impact. We're literally changing history with this film. Two colleges that we know of already, one in Missouri and one in Mississippi, have already changed their history curriculum because they saw our film, and they're including the history of the Chinese in the South in their curriculum. One middle school class just showed it to all their eighth grade classes and discussed this in New York. This small little film is having a big impact, and we're not stopping, we're making a second film now. Doctor, lawyer, interior designer, psychologist, singer, actress. Seemed a little ridiculous before, didn't it? CFO, singer, songwriter, music, composer, TV and radio host, filmmaker. It doesn't even fit in the box. So why don't we just get rid of the boxes? In fact, let's just all say, say no to boxes. You do not fit in a box. I do not fit in the box. We don't let people define who we are. We get to define who we are and what we do. A lot of people have said, you know what, you fit in this box. And sometimes it's the wrong box. They still do it today. You know, when I tell people all this, just imagine their heads are spinning after I tell them that I'm a TV host, I'm a recording artist, I'm a filmmaker. And they're like, oh my gosh, what, what do you do? And then even if people see that I'm a singer and they see my album cover, if they're not Asian, they're like, oh, you do K-pop? Like, really? I'm like, first of all, I'm not even Korean. Secondly, I sing in English and I do R&B, pop, dance, music, and jazz. But see, that's the thing. People have their preconceived expectations. So it's up to us to tell our stories and help them redefine who we are and what their expectations are. Someone once told me there are two types of artists in this world. Ones that want to be famous and ones that want to change the world. Back to that original question of what do you want to be when you grow up? I challenge and encourage you, as you answer that question moving forward, to not just think about one answer, but to also think about how you're going to do what you're going to do to influence people. How are you going to make a meaningful impact in this world? How are you going to make someone else's life better when you answer that question? Because in the end, stars fade away. But this world, oh, the world was supposed to stay. <laughs> the world, there it is. The world is gonna be here forever. And that is the impact that I know I wanna make in this world. Thank you. <laughs>